Welcome to part three of this week's online lecture. In part three, we will discuss rotational motion with respect to a diatomic molecule. We will now try to model the diatomic molecule. The simplest model of a diatomic molecule is to assume that the two atoms are connected by a massless rigid bond. This type of molecule is known as a rigid rotor. The mass of each atom is in the centre of each atom. There is no mass in between and the bond length doesn't change. These assumptions make the mathematics easier. But even with these assumptions, many of the features in the rotational spectrum of the diatomic are explained. So here we have end over end rotation. If we assume that the molecule is rotating in this plane, like so, with the atoms having mass m1 and mass m2, then the molecule will be rotating around the centre of mass. Now it is quite easy to think about where the centre of mass is if you have masses which are equal. The centre of mass will be equidistant between the two atoms. But where is the centre of mass when the atoms have different masses? Let's have a look at this situation and see if we can justify what is happening. If the bond length is r, and we assume that mass m1 is a distance r1 from the centre of mass, and that mass m2 is a distance r2 away from the centre of mass, how long is r1 compared to the bond length? And how long is R2 compared to the bond length? Well, the centre of mass is defined by this equation because the moment associated with mass M1 around the centre is going to be M1 R1 and the moment associated with mass M2 is going to be M2 R2. If we had a fulcrum at the centre of mass then it would not rotate in any particular direction. This occurs when we have M1 R1 equal to M2 R2. In terms of a moment of inertia, we have only two particles to consider. So this sum can be broken down into the component for particle 1 and the component for particle 2. We can use these equations to define the moment of inertia for a diatomic molecule in terms of the bond length R. With a simple mathematical manipulation, we are going to introduce the concept of reduced mass. The moment of inertia about the centre of mass is with regards to a particular rotational axis. Remember that the rotational axis is always through the centre of mass. We already knew the expression for moment of inertia. But now we also know that M1 R1 is equal to M2 R2. Noting that the bond length, capital R, is equal to R1 plus R2, and with a little bit of manipulation, I can write R1 purely in terms of the bond length. There is a similar expression for R2. Substituting for both R1 and R2 into the moment of inertia equation, we'll find that the moment of inertia is equal to m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2 times the bond length squared. And we call m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 the reduced mass, which is given the symbol mu. So the moment of inertia for a diatomic system around the centre of mass is simply the reduced mass times the bond length squared. Let's have a look at what this means in terms of rotational motion. What kind of transformation have I done? One way of looking at this is that I started off with two masses, where one mass is R1 away from the rotational axis and the other is R2 away from the rotational axis. and I ended up with a moment of inertia equation that has one mass, the reduced mass, a distance r, which is the bond length, away from the rotational axis. 
Mathematically, the two-mass system is identical to the reduced-mass system. This mathematical transformation simplifies our equations, which is why we did it. We're going to calculate the reduced mass for diatomics quite a lot, but there is an issue here with regard to isotopes. Which masses should we employ? For instance, what is the reduced mass of dinitrogen or N2? How would I calculate it? Where would you go to look up the reduced mass of N2? All we really need is the mass of the nitrogen atom. If I go to the periodic table, it will tell me that the relative atomic mass for atomic nitrogen is 14.007 atomic units. Could I use that? We saw before what happens when we have carbon-12 and carbon-13 monoxide. They gave rise to overlapping spectra. They didn't lead to an average spectrum. This means that we have to use the isotopic mass, not the relative mass of all isotopes, because this is an average in terms of the relative abundances of the isotopes. So if we have nitrogen-14, we would use 14.003, and if it was nitrogen-15, it's 15.000. It just so happens that about 1% is found as nitrogen-15. This would make a difference in terms of where the spectral lines occur, as we saw for carbon monoxide. So it is important, and in fact, if our instrument was good enough, we would see two overlapping spectra between the nitrogen-14 nitrogen diatomic and perhaps a small amount of nitrogen-14, nitrogen-15 diatomic. But of course, I wouldn't be able to see the spectra because they are homonuclear. But we could see the effect of differing isotopes in the spectra of something like carbon monoxide. The bottom line is, you cannot use the relative atomic mass, you must use the isotopic mass. This is the end of part three of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part four.